Cabernet tends to be the sort of Errol Flynn of the great varieties. To meet a global bartending legend. People always ask, how do you get involved in sake and how does that connect to music? Great single malt whiskey is made in the brewery. Conventional winemakers who just condemn all natural wine as faulty. It exploded onto the Australian brewing scene. A really beautiful, harmonious community of artisan producers. All these geopolitical incidents will affect whiskey down the line. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson, and this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine, and spirits, and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Welcome back to the Drinks Adventures podcast for this final episode of season five. We've been hearing a lot recently about how the COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented event. And for many of us, it certainly has been. But not for Ian Ford, who in 1999 founded Chinese distribution business Summergate Fine Wines and Spirits, and soon after was confronted with the SARS epidemic. SARS had very similar impacts on the Chinese drinks industry to that of COVID-19. So Ian has a unique perspective on recent events and what the next few months could look like for those of us who are in the process of emerging from lockdown. But this interview was also an opportunity to find out a bit more about the Chinese drinks market from Ian, who has an intimate understanding of the local consumption trends. Since selling Summergate to Australian retailer Woolworths in 2014, Ian founded a new company called Nimbility, which provides expertise to wine, spirits and beer producers seeking to export their products to Asia. And in fact, I know of at least one company previously featured on Drinks Adventures that has used Nimbility's services. First up though, You'll hear from Ian how he originally came to relocate from New York City to begin a career in the Chinese drinks industry in 1995. And that's coming up in just a moment. Now, I'm no brewer or distiller, but I have a fair few friends in the industry who are, and I know where they go to source the ingredients they need to make the wonderful beers and spirits that we all enjoy drinking. I'm talking, of course, about Bintani. With experts in all categories on the team, Bintani understands how brewing and distilling ingredients work together like no other supplier. Bintani handpicks the best. Born and raised in New York City, Ian Ford has been working in the beverage industry in China since 1995. I went to college at Duke University in North Carolina, and that was back in the late 80s, early 90s, and I chose to study Mandarin Chinese at that time. And that sort of set me on a lifelong journey. Uh, I took a year off during my undergrad career and, and spent a year living in Shanghai and Beijing. And um, I graduated from Duke with a real desire to go back to China and work for a while. And I, I didn't have a, a, a grand scheme. I certainly felt like I wanted to get to China, work there, experience the country, use the Chinese language that I had studied. And I was offered a job ultimately with a company called Seagram, which was one of the large international wine and spirits companies at the time. They were the owners of Chivas Regal, Martel, Captain Morgan, Crown Royal, uh, a series of pretty big spirits brands. The company doesn't exist now. It was acquired and broken up. But in any case, that was the job and the job offer that was my vehicle to go to China. And what did the market for wine and spirits look like when you first arrived? Well, the two categories actually were quite different. So the wine category was very much for tourists and foreign visiting businessmen uh, in their, in their uh, interactions and, and uh, entertaining and dining and interactions with their Chinese counterparts. There was virtually zero indigenous market for still wine in China at that time. Very, very small. And the market was entirely in five-star international hotels and Western restaurants or or international restaurants. Spirits, on the other hand, had already built a pretty strong traction in the local market. It was about gifting. It was about business entertaining. And it was also something that had become quite popular in, in nightclubs around the country. And it was an interesting time in China. I mean, it was the first emergence of any sort of market economy, private ownership, private enterprise, really was just at its very embryonic stage at that point. And cognac in particular, and and a bit later on, scotch whiskey, became sort of the lubricant of a lot of the business dealings that were going on. It became quite chic and de rigueur to offer and share uh, glasses of of cognac over business dinners and to, to seal business deals. So the cognac 
category in particular at the time was was very different. It was a big Chinese New Year gifting item. There was a there were massive promotional campaigns that were already being implemented at that time around the Chinese New Year gifting opportunity. And so gift packaging and gift boxes and gift campaigns were a huge source of cognac sales in the market at that time. So the two categories, wine and spirits, were actually very different and still are, frankly, to this day. Beginning in sales and marketing roles at Seagram, Ian was subsequently appointed to work alongside Boston Consulting Group on a strategic review of Seagram's China operations. And it was fascinating. It was everything from regulatory licensing, logistics, wholesaler distributor management systems and strategies. So it was really a a crash course in a whole bunch of different areas of the China drinks business. And actually coming out of the back end of that, I had identified wine as a category that I thought was an interesting opportunity in the mainland China market. The folks at Seagram did not entirely agree with me. And I think the reason was pretty obvious. At that point, Martel Cognac was doing very, very well in mainland China. Chivas Regal was the up-and-coming brand. Uh, Both of those brands are still doing very, very well in China. Uh, And wine, I think, was seen as a bit more peripheral and less lucrative for a big spirits company. So in any case, I decided to pull out of my role at Seagram at that time, and I started Summergate. Uh, in 1999, together with Brendan O'Toole, who was one of the lead managers from Boston Consulting Group. So the two of us, uh, having done that strategy project and with the blessing of the the higher ups at Seagram, um, we went and started Summergate, uh, which was a company in the, in the early stages dedicated to importing, marketing and, and distributing bottled wines into mainland China. And then of course, For 15 years, we built Summergate up into one of the leading importers and distributors of wine and then mineral water and then spirits into mainland China. And at a certain point, we expanded to greater China, including Hong Kong and Macau. Ian and his new business partner, Brendan O'Toole, formerly of Boston Consulting, took a trip to VinExpo, a wine exhibition held in Bordeaux, France in 1999. We had really no business to show anyone at that point other than our ideas and plans. And you must have still been really quite young at that stage. Yeah, I was 27, I think, when we started the company. So yeah, pretty young. I had some years at Seagram under my belt, but beyond that, that was it. And obviously, I I could speak Chinese at that point. After five years in the market, my Chinese had gotten a lot better. But I think also there weren't a lot of other options. You know, a lot of wineries were not really even being confronted with the option of shipping to mainland China back in those days. There, There were not a lot of companies importing and distributing in the mainland China market. And I think it was all kind of one day China is going to be big. So it would be a good idea to get in early, get in now and start building your brand. And what else made you and Brendan so confident in the potential of wine in China? There were a few factors that we thought were compelling. One obviously was the sense that China was on a very clear path of economic growth and wealth generation and private enterprise and disposable income and the growth of a middle class. So from an economic standpoint, there was a strong sense that there was going to be the customer base, the consumer base, the Chinese people were going to have the disposable income and the interest and the prosperity to be able to participate or to play in the in the sort of the wine world. There was also a very strong belief on my part that given China's very robust and dynamic dining culture, which is one of the most dynamic I've seen anywhere on earth. The Chinese love to go out and eat and drink together around big round tables in a very, very social setting. When you drink, you always drink with someone. It's something that is very different from a Western culture where you might just sip your wine and, and uh, sniff, sniff your wine or take a sip and enjoy it. In China, it's always you find another person and you smile at them and you raise your glass and cheers to them. So much is celebrated and enjoyed and done over a big meal with friends or colleagues or family. And we felt, and I felt, that wine had an absolutely essential role to play in that occasion moving forward, given the importance of wine in a, in a dining setting as opposed to cognac, or in my view, baijiu, the Chinese spirit, that wine had a much more pivotal role to play in that occasion and a, and a better and a better fit in that dining occasion. The other thing I, I felt was... The Chinese have an inherent, it's a dangerous business uh, generalizing about the entire Chinese population, but there is a sense of connoisseurship that exists and you can see it very much in the tea category. So when it comes to tea, there is a genuine, very deep connoisseurship 
associated with tea and where the origins of the tea and where the leaves come from and how they're picked and dried. And then the, the ritual of how it's prepared and presented. And given that level of connoisseurship and precision and that this sort of sense of ritual around the consumption of tea, I also felt that wine had a natural fit into that sort of an arena, if you will. I guess it's that classic question of, you know, the, the foreign shoe salesman shows up at a new market and, or there are two salesmen and one of them says, well, nobody here is wearing shoes. I'm, I'm going home. And the other guy says, well, nobody here is wearing shoes. I've got a massive market. I guess I was sort of the latter. I felt that there was a huge upside for, for wine with the Chinese consumer. How big was the Chinese wine market at that stage? It was approximately 250,000 nine-liter cases, bottled wine imported into China when we started Summergate in 1999. And it's now running at somewhere between 55 to 60 million. I think it peaked at 62 million nine-liter cases. And for many years, we were witnessing the market either double year on year or grow 70% or 50%. There were a couple of bumps in the road along the way, but I mean, the growth trajectory was massive. And look, I think uh, most of what I had expected to happen actually transpired. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the middle class has adopted wine as, as a, an essential part of their lifestyle, but still there's a huge upside. Per capita consumption of, of wine in China is still, is still very, very low compared to other comparable markets. So there's still a long way to go, despite the fact that it's already one of the top imported wine markets in the world today. Other than the work that importers like Summergate were doing, what were the other catalysts that led to that increase in wine consumption? Because that's obviously pretty incredible growth. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting phenomenon that, that took place was what's referred to as the French paradox, or the, the idea that the French uh, consume very fatty foods, but they have very low rate of heart disease. And that's ascribed in some circles to the, the very regular common consumption of particularly red wine uh, in France. And the sense that red wine is good for your circulation, it's good for your heart, if obviously consumed very much in moderation. This was a phenomenon that was widely reported in, in the Chinese media. Uh, and obviously the government has quite firm grip on the media and the sort of propaganda and what is promoted. And there were motivations on the part of the Chinese government to try to elevate consumption of red wine the Baijiu category in China is enormous. And certainly back in, in those days, in 98, 99, 2000, consumption of Baijiu was really significant. And it's a very, very high alcohol drink. So the Chinese government had a couple of, I think, motivations at that point in promoting the idea of drinking red wine. One was a health component. And, you know, drinking a couple, a couple of glasses of red wine at lunch versus, you know, a couple of shots of 56% alcohol by Joe or three or four shots, uh, I think they felt was much better for the society at large. But there was another interesting phenomenon, and that is that by is made from grain. And because of the size and scale of the by category, it was consuming a huge amount of China's domestic grain capacity, a noticeable proportion. And China was a net importer of grain, whereas wine grapes could be grown in quite inhospitable places in the country where perhaps grain and other, other staples wouldn't be grown. Uh, and I think there was a sense that they could convert some of that alcohol consumption to wine that could be produced from grapes grown in certain parts of China that would replace the grain consumption of Baijiu. So there were a couple of motivating factors. And I, I think there also became gradually a bit of a social badging. Like drink, drinking red wine is a symbol or a sign that I'm international. I'm much more urbane and, and sophisticated than my other fellow citizens. And so drinking red wine also became a, a symbol or a signal to those watching in a very conspicuous way that I'm sophisticated and I'm successful and I'm international. I heard a pretty incredible anecdote about an event that you staged on the Great Wall of China in Summergate's early years to launch the Concha Itoro brand. That was a real watershed moment, I think, for us, for Concha Itoro and, and for the industry. We launched Concha Itoro in Asia. Uh, so we, had, we were not distributing Concha Itoro anywhere outside of China at that time. But we centered the launch of their brand across Asia in Beijing with a gala event on the Great Wall of China. So in addition to all of the domestic guests that we had brought out to this event, Concha Itoro had also brought in their importers from South Korea, Japan, Thailand, Hong Kong, 
Singapore, Vietnam. Conchi Toro held a day of seminars and conferences and sessions with all of their importers. And then the next day in the evening, we had this gala launch event for Conchi Toro Asia on the Great Wall. And it was a fabulous event. It was an incredible occasion. We had the chairman of Conchi Toro was there with us. We had the ambassadors from Chile and Mexico and Argentina and a, and a few others. And this was, of course, back at a time in 2000, I believe it was, 2000 or 2001, when you could do this sort of event. This is not something that would be, I don't even think, possible to do today because of the regulatory environment and the restrictions put on any sort of this type of activity on a site as important as the Great Wall of China. But back then, I went there as a young man and knocked on the door of the management office of the Great Wall and asked them if it would be okay if we did a dinner event on the Great Wall. (laughs) (laughs) And we sort of went from there. It ended up being quite an extraordinary thing. But it really set the stage for Conchi Toro for many, many years to come, for Casiero del Diablo's incredible growth and brand positioning in China and across Asia. And it was an extraordinary commitment from Conchi Toro, given the scale of what Summergate was shipping into China at the time. I recall the, the look on the face of the CEO of Conchi y Toro as we had lunch in Santiago at the very, very beginning of our partnership and business with them. And the stunned look on his face when he heard how small our first order was for China. (laughs) I think he still jokes about that story now when he talks about the China market. Uh, But it was very, very small beginnings. But obviously, the market now is, as I said, one of the top imported markets in the world. Conchi Toro is shipping well in excess of a million cases of wine annually now into China on the basis of very, very sound brand awareness, brand positioning, consumer loyalty, and very good distribution. And that took a long time to build in China. And it's a very, very strong foundation that producers like that have that started back in those very early days. So it was very soon after that, in late 2002, that SARS first emerged, which must have been about the worst possible timing for Summergate. (laughs) Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Uh, It's one of those things that you just never plan for, obviously. Uh, as we're all experiencing these days. The only saving grace for us at the time was that because we hadn't really actually grown so big in terms of our team and our overheads and infrastructure, that we were able to be flexible and nimble enough to to, to sort of wiggle our way through that and adjust our, our, our business model and you know tighten up on our overheads and costs and 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 we managed to survive through the the roughly six months of of the complete shutdown of the market that took place producers that we worked with that understood the difficulty we were going through but believed in us and believed in our partnership and were able to work with us on extended payment terms and work with us on promotional mechanisms and promotional support and a and p budget that was something that I, i i never forgot And as an importer in China, going through such a difficult time and having the strong support of some partners like Villa Maria and Conchi Toro and a a few others was completely essential to us surviving that period. And it was something that earned the loyalty of Summergate to those producers from that point on. And what did the lockdown actually look like in China during SARS? Well, I mean, restaurants and bars and hotels, you know, very quickly went from full business to no business. And it became very apparent to us quite quickly that hotels running at 5% occupancy and restaurants shut down, that we needed to rethink the business model quickly. That happened fairly rapidly. And there was a lot of panic, I, I have to say. I think there was no playbook for what to do about it. We didn't have a reference to a previous episode of this in recent history. We were flying blind in terms of how long is this going to last? How bad is it going to get? I could not travel domestically in China without being quarantined. So I was in Beijing and my business partner was in Shanghai and we didn't see each other for six months. And were there times during the SARS epidemic where you thought that Summergate actually wouldn't make it? I think I probably woke up every morning <laughs> wondering about that question <laughs> during that period. I don't, I don't think a day went by when I didn't wonder whether or not we were going to make it. Uh, you know, we didn't have financial backers. We were self-funded and, uh, you know, it was a purely entrepreneurial organization and set up between the two founding partners. So, you know, we had to make ends meet. One of the things that we did do was to shift gears from 
uh, we were primarily a supplier to the on trade, which was the main market in the early knots. Uh, the main market in China was the restaurant trade, the hotel trade. There weren't really wine bars back then. Uh, there was a bit of a bit of retail to be done. There were the, the likes of Carrefour already had a, a significant imported wine business, and you know we would try to do business with them and a few other retailers. What we did though at the time of SAR is pretty quickly we recognized that people were going to continue to to drink wine, but they're more likely to be doing it at home and not going out to restaurants and probably possibly not going out to supermarkets either. So. We needed to figure out how we could get the wine to them, which prompted us to 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 develop a direct direct to consumer or home delivery business for wine, which is what we did. And and it was a very important gear shift for us to be able to continue to make sales and continue to to you know supply wine to people that still wanted to buy wine. Um, and that that was an important gear shift, and I think it's part of what really got us through. It, it it enabled us to generate enough revenue and income to be able to keep the lights on and to get through the sort of the real dark days of SARS and get out the other end. And did you continue with that home delivery offering after the epidemic was over? Yeah, we sure did. I mean that that was the origin, the very beginnings of our retail business that carried on throughout the existence of Summergate, and at one stage became a company called Pudao the sister company of Summergate underneath the umbrella of the parent company. And Pudau is to this day is one of the best wine retailers in the country, in my view, a uh, specialist wine retailer with, with retail stores in, in Beijing and Shanghai. And the origins of that really were that direct to consumer business that we launched during SARS. Interestingly in China, you know, you don't have anywhere near the sort of regulatory environment applied to the trade that you have in Australia or in North America with the three tier system. Or in Australia, where the regulations surrounding wine and uh, beverage alcohol retail are quite strict, in China, as a as a licensed entity, we were able to import. We could sell to distributors. We could sell to retailers and restaurants and hotels. We could sell directly to the consumer. So there was no tier system whatsoever. And retail liquor licensing in China is extremely liberal. Everybody who has a license to sell retail food and beverage can sell alcohol, and that meant that we could engage in any stage of the supply chain that we chose to. Uh, and so that also was what enabled us to be able to to start and and run and build Pudau as a as a wine and spirits specialist retailer. And did SARS have any lasting impacts on consumption behaviors in China? Honestly. My feeling there is no, and the reason I say that, and I think it's different now, and I think this time around will be different, but the reason I say that about SARS is that the entire industry was so young and embryonic at that point that so many things happened after that that changed the landscape of the imported wine category in China that by the time we got to 2007, 2008, you know, SARS was a distant memory and the, the, you know, the Chinese indigenous demand for wine and interest in wine and, and wine consumption and had completely changed the landscape of the imported wine industry in the category where wine, you know, it moved out of the fancy French and Italian restaurants and the five-star hotels and it moved into the broader general arena of the China market, Chinese restaurants and, and local retail and all of that. So I think it's hard to trace a trend back to something that emerged out of SARS. Whereas I think this time around, home consumption of wine may have had a real shot in the arm, if I can say it that way, um, during this period where the Chinese were very, very compliant with the Chinese government's requirement to lock down and not go out to restaurants and not go to bars and you know the whole stay at home, shelter at home kind of thing. And several... Uh, entities that I am in contact with on a regular basis that have direct to consumer businesses where they do home delivery have been reporting record sales in March, April, and May. I think that that's likely to not go away as restaurants and bars and as they reopen as on trade business comes back to life and it, and it certainly will come back to life. I think what we're going to see, though, is a residual home consumption 
and direct to consumer and retail business that's going to emerge out of the back end of the COVID-19 period. When the SARS epidemic came to an end, did it take some time for consumers to be confident to go out to bars and restaurants again, or was it a pretty rapid rebound? Well, I think if you recall, SARS just sort of petered out. It just stopped transmitting. And I think the epidemic was declared over in September. And I, I suspect it was probably the behavior of some of these viral infections that, that tend to peter out during the summer and then potentially come back again in the winter. And so I think with SARS by September, which I, if I recall correctly, was when everything was lifted, I think there was a real confident sense that it was behind us. It was done. There wasn't so much of a gradual return to normalcy. It, it happened very quickly. I think what we're seeing now is definitely more gradual, but still I think the rebound is underway in China right now as we speak. I should point out that this interview with Ian was recorded on June 11, 2020, before the most recent outbreak of COVID-19 in Beijing. Our biggest challenge coming out of the, the back end of SARS was for months we had been working very hard to keep, keep our inventories as tight as possible. Uh, working capital and cash flow was a major concern and consideration. We didn't have any idea how long SARS was really going to last. There was nobody that could say, well, you just have to get through six months and then you'll be fine. I mean, no, nobody knew the answer to that question at the time. As with everybody else, we had to manage our working capital and our inventory very, very carefully. And then, you know, the World Health Organization declared the SARS epidemic was over. The global travel ban to China was lifted. Travel insurance to, for business people traveling to China was reinstated. The domestic quarantine regime was lifted in China. And so business came roaring back. But we had three to four months lead time to order product and get it into China. So the biggest problem we had at that point was actually uh, satisfying demand once the rebound occurred. I think we're probably going to see something similar this time around, although the dynamic is quite different in the sense that with SARS, it was primarily a China problem, whereas now it's be because it's such a global issue, China has closed their border to foreign visitors, as have a lot of countries around the world and around Asia. So the rebound may not be as robust, particularly anything related to international business and entertaining and, and, and all of that sort of thing. What would you have done differently if you were confronted with that same situation again, as obviously many importers currently are today? I guess, I mean, obviously hindsight is 2020. I would have tried to have a better preparation for the rebound. If I could go back and do it again. And if I was an importer today in China, looking at my current situation, whatever means that I had at my disposal to try to prepare appropriate inventory for a market rebound, I would do my best to try and do that. And I would look for help probably from my producer partners to, to en enable me to be able to do that, to have as much as reasonably possible inventory on the ground to be prepared for that rebound. Ian Ford and Brendan O'Toole sold Summergate to Australian supermarket retailer Woolworths in 2015 for US $25 million. We got up to a point where, you know, we had 13 offices across uh, greater China. We had about, I think, 350 to 400 employees across sales and marketing and finance and logistics. I think we had something in the realm of 10 to 15,000 uh, direct clients that we were selling to. Uh, and then a whole network of first-tier distributors that we were selling to that were then selling on into the local regional markets. I mean, again, that the whole point of us being able to be nimble and flexible enough to sort of wiggle our way through SARS and get through to the back end of it, we would have not have that degree of flexibility 10 years later, for sure. And there were companies that didn't make it out of SARS. There were companies that were already bigger than us at that time that I think SARS was the beginning of the end for them uh, for that reason. Coming up next in this extended interview with Ian Ford, we discuss some of the biggest mistakes that drinks companies make when they try to crack the China market, and what's currently happening in craft spirits and craft beer. This episode of Drinks Adventures is supported by Fever Tree Premium Mixers, the mixer of choice in the world's best bars and restaurants. Right now, I'm enjoying Fever Tree's Mediterranean tonic for a more delicate touch on some of the fine Australian gins you've heard discussed on the show. 
Moving on to your current business, Nimbility, I can see from your website that you're already working with a range of wine and spirits producers on building exports to China and other Asian markets. Are there any specific brand attributes that you're looking for in potential clients? So yes, Nimbility is a partnership. We help producers to build their markets in Asia. And that's a combination of the nuts and bolts of importers and distribution and route to market, and also brand building, communications and messaging and activation. And the third bit being market intelligence. So gathering and analyzing all of the information that's sort of swirling around in the Asian markets and pulling that together and providing it back to the producers that we work with. In terms of attributes for the market, I think there's no one profile or style or positioning of a brand that I think is necessarily suited. Very often what we look for and what we seek out in the clients that we're working with is authenticity, credible storytelling, something that is unique and is authentic and real. It could be a story about your grandfather who founded the winery, or it could be a particular really interesting production technique that you employ. But I think authenticity is something that for the Chinese consumer in particular is very often what they're looking for. They want to know that this is the real McCoy, if you will. It's something that really is credible, authentic, the genuine article. It's why we very often we advise producers against the idea of tailoring their product or particularly their visual identity or brand to the China market. So for example, adding Chinese characters onto the front label or engineering a sort of made for China label with dragons and phoenixes on it, red and gold labels. <laughs> uh, it, you know, that, that sort of thing runs completely contrary really to what the Chinese consumer is looking for, which is something that is authentically imported from the country of origin. So they want something that they believe is genuinely Australian and has credibility and is authentic. They don't want something that's engineered for them. What about that old practice of using Australian um, native animals <laughs> to market products? So c kangaroos or yeah. um, whatever it might be. There's a beer brand in Australia called Brew, which is spelled B-R-O-O, and they have a kangaroo on the label. And they seem to think that having that kangaroo on the label is going to make the product irresistible for Chinese consumers. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I hope that Brew has more going for them than just the, the kangaroo on the label. Have you heard of Brew out of interest? No, I, I haven't. I honestly have not. No, look, I think gimmicks of any kind, you can potentially get near-term success. You can get some opportunistic transactional success. But that all comes out in the wash. And ultimately, if the goal is to build a long-term, serious, sustainable market in China, I don't believe you can do it on the basis of those very sort of shallow, gimmicky-led brands. Uh, I think that ultimately, if the goal is to create genuine, sustainable consumer loyalty, consumer interest, consumer demand, that has to be done on the basis of something that, that can hold their interest over a long period of time. The interest in a bottle that has a kangaroo on it expires very quickly, and you know the consumer moves on. I don't think that those are really sustainable brands that can build a market over a long period of time and really get to the point where, I mean, look, producers are going to be profitable in China when they don't have to pay for the demand for every single bottle that they're selling. If you go into China with a push strategy and, and you're pushing your product all the time and you're not creating pull through through the consumer, that the consumer is actually pulling your brand through naturally, organically, because they've fallen in love with your brand, you're never going to make any money. It doesn't even matter if you start to get bigger in scale. It's, it's very difficult to convert that into a business where you can actually make some money because you're constantly having to push the product through the supply chain and that costs money. So the end game for me, for any serious brand, any serious producer in China has to be the creation of consumer demand over a longer period of time. Once you achieve that critical mass and the consumer is, is organically pulling your product through the supply chain, that's when things start to become really interesting. And when you look at brands like Penfolds, Casiero del Diablo, to an extent, Yellowtail, and in the spirits category, if you look at Chivas Regal and Hennessy Cognac, that's what they've achieved. And their China markets now are, are very sustainable and are very profitable for them. 
So you obviously think that the Yellowtail brand has more depth to it than just, just the critter on the label. I think they do. I think what happened in China is because they're so successful in the US and they can talk about how big the brand is, that becomes credibility to many buyers in the China market. There's a lot of notoriety around Yellowtail. It isn't just the label anymore, right? It's a massive brand. It's a hugely successful brand. And that actually carries quite a bit of credibility with it. It went into the US as a completely unknown creation through Bill Deutsch and uh, as a replacement for Lindemann's in that whole distribution network. It came into China with the backing of 10 to 12 million cases being sold in North America and a very, very strong, incredible brand. They were also pretty savvy at creating an online business. They did quite well through the big e-commerce platforms of Tmall and JD.com. One of the rare instances of a brand really being able to leverage the online platforms to project and amplify their brand. What are the biggest mistakes that brands make when they're trying to break into China? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> I hate to say that, but uh, I think getting with the wrong partner is probably mistake number one. Any serious producer who's looking at dedicating resources to China you know, really needs to do the due diligence, get good advice, get second opinions, really understand who the players are. You know, what is, what is the... What, what are the channels that I need to be in to be able to reach the consumers that I want to reach? Who are the importers that are going to be able to seriously, incredibly take me to those channels? And which of them am I able to work with? Okay, you can sort of narrow the list down. And it seems like sort of market entry 101, but it's extraordinary to me the number of people that will jump into bed with a partner in China uh, that has sold them on a story of you know, they have great connections with the military and somehow that's going to translate into great sustainable business for this particular brand, uh, you know, things like that. And I see a lot of brands, uh, you know, getting into a partnership with the wrong people. Uh, and I think that's a key mistake. I think looking at the China market as a monolith, thinking about, you know, what's right for the Chinese consumer is another big error in, in approach to China that I see. You know, I often describe the consumer in this way, you can imagine a 55-year-old gentleman living in West China in Chengdu in a, a local pharmaceutical business, doesn't really speak English, and the sort of wine preferences that that individual might have versus a young lady who's 28 years old who went to, went to university in Sydney, came back to China and works for McKinsey in Shanghai. You know, their behaviors as consumers, their preferences, what gets them excited, et cetera, are going to be so vastly different. So the idea of approaching China as a monolith or, or the Chinese consumer, I mean, the Chinese consumer is extremely diverse in their tastes and preferences and brand affinities and, and so on. And the same would apply regionally. So South China, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, very different from, extremely different from North China, Beijing and Tianjin and Dalian which are almost more like Korea than they are like South China, but also Shanghai and West China, Chengdu and Chongqing. I mean, regionally, China is also quite diverse and the cuisine is quite different and uh, you know, the climate and all of those factors. Imported spirits haven't followed the same growth trajectory as wine, which is surprising in that Chinese people were already spirits drinkers. Why do you think that is? Well, I think traditionally it was cognac and whiskey that were leading the charge uh, in the spirits category. And from a volume standpoint, they still are today. But I think cognac and whiskey ended up getting very much stuck into a narrow niche in terms of consumption occasion. Uh, and they certainly pretty much failed to take any market share off of the massive Baijiu category. But what we are seeing now, which is exciting, is a lot of energy in the cocktail and mixology space in China. We're seeing an explosion of cocktail bars and mixology. We're seeing the emergence of the sort of rock star bartenders, celebrity bartenders that own their own bars. And that's certainly very dynamic in a city like Shanghai, but it's also in Hangzhou and Chengdu and Shenzhen, Guangzhou, etc. I see there the origins of something really interesting. There's so much excitement and energy about cocktails and boutique spirits, craft spirits, you know, the gin category is, while still small in volume terms, you know, there's a lot of interest. 
And that younger generation, the 28-year-old young lady who went to university overseas and works for McKinsey, she's drinking cocktails. I mean, that's potentially one of the biggest threats to the imported wine category um, is, is actually the cocktail culture that's developing very, very quickly. And what about craft beer? There's a few American craft beer brands that I know have had a crack at the China market. And then the Australian brand Little Creatures has made a pretty big push. Do you think that any of these brands are getting traction? Well, they're certainly visible. Success, I think, you know, you've, you've got to ask the financial controller at the end of the day if it's successful or not. But um, certainly they're visible. Goose Island has been very, very visible. Obviously, they have the backing of ABI, Anheuser-Busch, InBev. They've been pretty assertive in getting Goose Island out into the market. You know, one of the challenges facing craft beer as a category is the Chinese regulations related to micro brewing, as we used to call it, or, or craft brewing at a small scale. To get a, a QA certificate and a QA license to produce and bottle craft beer at a small scale is almost impossible. The requirements to be licensed to get what's called a QS uh, stamp, which basically certifies the product to be fit for human consumption and is required on packaged food and beverage products. To get that, the scale of the brewery has to be massive relative to what a normal craft brewer would set out to do. So for somebody other than ABI or someone like them, it makes it very, very difficult to actually brew and bottle at a scale of a craft beer brand in China. So what you end up with is either brands that want to market themselves as craft beer, but are really piggybacking on the massive brewing facilities of somebody like an ABI, or you have imported product. You have bottled beer coming in from Australia or North America or Europe. And the problem there, of course, is freshness and shelf life and lead times and the supply chain in China, where it's not very efficient, it's not very timely to market. And so if you have beer that is best consumed within a six-month Time frame, it's very difficult to get it produced in Australia, bottled, put into a container, shipped to China, cleared through customs, put into the supply chain, out into the retail environment, and bought by a consumer within six months. You also have to worry that the beer has been handled properly throughout all of that. Yeah, and realistically, hop driven beers are really at their best, you know, within three months of packaging. Correct. That's right. That's right. And I know serious craft brewers who have come out to Asia and had their own beer in a bar or in a venue in Hong Kong and Shanghai and been horrified at the state that the beer was in. <laughs> and, you know, and so that's a big problem. So the Chinese consumer for craft beer is not being served. My sense is you have the biggest beer market in the world, in China. You absolutely have a significant proportion of those consumers who would like to drink good craft beer, and they're not being served. So I've looked at this several times, and to me, there is a massive market opportunity there that needs to get figured out. And actually, before the interview, you were telling me that you've personally considered the possibility of opening a craft brewery in China, what that would look like? I've certainly taken a long, hard look at it, yes. Is there any push to change that prohibitive legislation? I'm not aware of any imminent change in the regulation and the beer industry, they don't really have a lobby in China. It doesn't really work that way, but the power and influence of the beer industry, both domestic and foreign, there would be a lot of opposition from those corners of the industry. What you do see, and, and credit to the guys who've done it, what you do see is incredible craft beer brands that are done as, as, as uh, kegged beer. So they, you have Great Leap, uh, Jing A, Boxing Cat, which ultimately was acquired by ABI, and, and several others who built their brand as a brew pub. And so they brewed on site, and then they would gradually expand maybe a few brew pubs, and then they would start selling their beer in kegs to other restaurants and bars and craft beer bars. And, but all of those guys have struggled to break through to packaged beer, to bottled or canned beer. Uh, and ultimately, that's what really needs to happen. If you're going to be accessible to the, to the craft beer consumer in China, they have to be able to buy you in a retail store or online and have it delivered and that sort of thing. And to do that, you have to be in bottles or cans. You can serve a beer in a restaurant. That's governed by restaurant licensing, and it's very liberal. 
as soon as you produce it domestically and package it in cans or bottles, you need that QS code on the individual package itself. And to get that, that's where all those heavy regulations come into play. It's obviously a very rapidly evolving situation right now in China, but I asked Ian how things were looking on the ground when we recorded this interview. At that time, he was stuck in California, with China having closed its borders due to the pandemic. I'm on the phone and on Zoom and all that with China basically every day now, including Hong Kong and also Singapore. And in the mainland, things are are really looking up. We're seeing a lot of return to normalcy, restaurants, hotels, bars open, uh, domestic travel has has been loosened up, so our, my own my own colleagues, but also other business people, are able to travel travel around China now and go between cities. Um, people are going back to work. The kids had gone back to school. That's obviously not now. It's it's the summer break. Um, and what we're seeing from many many uh, of our of our partners across the industry are claims of anywhere from sixty to eighty percent. Uh, of of what they would consider normal business, so so their business their 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 sales have 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 returned to anywhere between sort of 60, 70, 80 percent of what they would normally expect at this time of year. Um, so that that's all very encouraging in terms of of the market in in, in my view. Um, you know, importers are are replenishing their inventory. They're shipping wine. Um, the direct-to-consumer guys are going like a house on fire. Uh, I've, I've never seen them doing so well. Um, and but we're but we're what we're also seeing is a return to the on-trade business. The fact that China's border is still closed to foreign visitors is a is still putting a bit of a damper on economic recovery and the recovery of the of the wine and spirits market. So that that's an element that is still. I think, an impediment to the market coming back to full strength. But overall, that sounds like pretty good news uh, for Australian companies like Treasury Wine Estates that yep. rely very heavily on the China market. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're already seeing, like I said, we're seeing importers uh, start to replenish their inventories and, and you know, ship, ship wine from around the world. Um, and and it, it, it seems to all be pointing in a very good direction uh, in terms of any... any uh, uh, indication of a of a a return or resurgence, you know, knock on wood, obviously of 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 the virus. Um, so um, yeah, no, I, I think there there there's very very good reasons to be cautiously optimistic that that the China market could be a very positive source of 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 you know ongoing or new business for producers in Australia and around the world. And what about you? Is there any news on your bid to return home to Shanghai? I'm hopeful at this point. I was actually granted special approval from the government of Shanghai to apply for re-entry to China uh, as, a, as an emergency special case, as, a, as a, a business owner and operator based in Shanghai. So it's one first step in what is a long bureaucratic process. But, um, you know, I'm hopeful that I'm going to be able to get back to Shanghai on that basis sooner rather than later. And I guess you'd have to quarantine upon arrival in China? I believe so. Yeah. Unless they start to uh, implement a a testing uh, regime, which is possible, where I would be tested on arrival and, and, and held until the test results came back. But I think right now, the, the regime that's in place right now is a quarantine regime. So I would be in 14-day quarantine, most likely in a government-run facility. That doesn't sound like much fun. Oh, it sounds like a, a, a glorious, what a pleasure, what a pleasure that's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ian, thanks so much for your time. It's been such an informative chat about the China market. And best of luck with Nimbility and getting home to Shanghai. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the time, James. The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links, and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.